The Rings of Power is a masterpiece, an epic saga. Tolkien would be proud. The Rings of Power is poop. It's written like poop. The acting is poop. The dialogue is aggressive diarrhea. There are a lot of ways to describe this show, but if you're in a hurry, that sums it up for you. You know, some people call that art. It's crap! Welcome to the extended edition of my Rings of Power video collection. In honor of the impending horror that is season two wrapping filming, and to fulfill my love of compilation videos, I've re-edited and reshuffled my original Rings of Power as a travesty series into one, reaching little platoon level video link. Hola, fellow Latinx. Rings of Power lives entirely off of nostalgia for Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings film trilogy, with member berry after member berry thrown at you to try and keep you engaged. <laughs> Because the writers don't have an actual story to adapt. It's nothing but uber expensive fan fiction. It wants to emulate Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films in every way, but also desires to stand on its own, and fails spectacularly at accomplishing either. The fact that most positive reviews talk almost exclusively about the show's grandeur of scenery, set pieces, and its CGI splendor should illuminate just how lacking the story and acting departments are. The costume design also looked pretty rough in the promotional material, and it lives up to that anticipated poor quality with CW level outfits for most of the characters. It's honestly pretty pathetic. I'm a fan of Tolkien in Lord of the Rings, although probably not classified as a super fan or Tolkien scholar, whatever that means. I feel like that was a respectable title to have until this show happened. I'm gonna go Galadriel. Yes. Yes. Galadriel. 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 I'm already yeah. obsessed. Cool. Stunning and beautiful. Corruption and manipulation. <laughs> Hi, my name is Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor. I'm president of Signum University, and I've been doing a podcast on Tolkien called The Tolkien Professor for more than 10 years now. You fucking nerd! As a fan but not super fan, I realized a lot of parallels between what's going on in the Rings of Power world and, well, every other bit of popular culture at the moment. It does indeed rear its head here, and here I am, not minding my own business. Amazon can't seem to shut the fuck up about diversity because it's what they were droning on and on about since day one of the announcement of Rings of Power. Todd Bowles, Tampa Bay Buccaneers head coach in the National Football League, said it best recently when he was asked about how his skin color relates to active hiring of black NFL coaches. You and Mike Tomlin are two of the few black head coaches in the league. I wonder what your relationship is like with them and your thoughts on Steve Wilkes joining that fold. I have a very good relationship with Tomlin. Uh, we don't look at what color we are when we coach against each other. We just know each other. I have a lot of very good white friends that coach in this league as well, and I don't think it's a big deal as far as us being coaching against each other. I think it's normal. Wilkes got an opportunity to do a good job. Hopefully he does it. And we coach ball. We don't look at color. But you also understand that representation matters too, right? And that when young aspiring coaches or even football players, they see you guys, you know, they see someone that looks like them, maybe grew up like them, that has to mean something. Well, when you say you see you guys and look like them and grow up like them, it means that we're eyeballs to begin with. And I think the minute you guys start, stop making a big deal about it, everybody else will as well. Hiring a diverse cast isn't new, it isn't stunning, it isn't brave, although I don't want you to stop suggesting it, otherwise I'd have to stop mocking you for saying it, and for that, I would be sad. There's a reason no one complained about Jim Gordon being played by Jeffrey Wright, or Catwoman being played by Zoe Kravitz in the Batman movie this year. They were clearly outstanding in their roles and Warner Brothers smartly decided not to draw any attention to it. Maybe because they knew they had a banger of a project on their hands and didn't need to stir the fan bait pot in order to drum up conversation. They are both great actors and the finished product showed that they were clearly top-notch choices. When fan baiting dies down, studios, please, take a note from this, shut the fuck up about it, and do your job. Just do your job! Alright, don't try to make too much out of it! Just do your job! The Rings of Power is a literal chore to get through. At its very best, the show's better than anesthesia. At its worst, it's poorly acted with cringe-inducing dialogue, where there are already YouTube videos galore compiling the top 10 favorite cringe lines from the show, filled with embarrassingly written and horrendously delivered metaphors and faux poetry. You've always had sandstone in your granite as far as the elves were concerned. I will not be made a prisoner. I would sooner kneecap a stallion than seek to imprison the mighty commander of the Northern Army. We can return in force and sweep the enemy from these lands like salt from a table. The sea is always right. The sea is always right. This line led me to third-party embarrassment, and for whatever reason, I gave the show some credit that maybe this would pay off later. 
Turns out, no, it doesn't. It's just a thing they say. Just a line to try and sound profound while being inescapably cheesy. Going from shredded mozzarella to an entire cheddar wheel once you realize it ultimately leads nowhere and fast. And don't forget this epic banger. Give me the meat and give it to me raw. What the fuck? Characters are constantly saying things that completely contradict their previous actions, and the only explanation I can come up with is because the writers think the lines sound good or the plot needs them to say X when they should be saying Y. A perfect example of this is in the finale, when Strong Woman confronts Chad about a piece of parchment that leads her to believe he isn't who he says he is. That he's not the long-lost king of the Southlands because the line had been broken. He pulls a, oh shit, you got me, when he could easily just lie. Maybe the line was broken and there was an illegitimate child. Maybe it was kept a secret for whatever reason. But nah, fuck it. We need to hurry up and deliver something to the audience. So we'll just have Sauron give it up, faster than an 80s rock band groupie. Characters instantly become complete dipshits and are dumbfounded by the simplest things to make another character look more intelligent. For example, take not Sauron telling Kella Brimbor about mixing ores together. Kella Brimbor is a fucking master craftsman, and when he's talking to not Sauron about needing to amplify the power of Mithril, not Sauron suggests some ores just might do that, and Kella Brimbor is absolutely fucking flabbergasted by the most obvious and basic suggestion ever uttered. It's just fucking god tier level writing. And Rings of Power is a production that relies on mystery boxes to hide its non-existent story. Which makes sense, considering the showrunners are disciples of Jar Jar Abrams himself, the man responsible for the show Lost, a show that ran entirely off of the mystery box MacGuffin style of storytelling. What is the Black Rock? What do the numbers mean? What is the monster? Who are you people? That bridge is saying my name. What is a Nigerian priest doing on an island in the South Pacific? What happens to pregnant women on this island? And ultimately becoming a massive disappointment after it ended when audiences realized the mystery was far more alluring than the answers. Unfortunately for Rings of Power, there isn't much actual mystery or intrigue here because you'd be hard-pressed not to figure things out instantly. Or even worse, the mystery boxes presented aren't interesting enough for you to care about. The entire season hinges on the hope the audience will get excited over trying to figure out who's Sauron. If you didn't guess it was this guy by episode 4 at the latest, you are the target audience for this show. Or who's Gandalf 2.0? Hint, it's Gandalf. Who's Feminem? Surprise, who knows? Who cares? Because this plotline goes nowhere fast. Or who's Orc Daddy? I'm safe! Hell, you know we a shit, so fuck him! Or why is the Elven Tree dying? Hint, there's no reason given other than it just happens because that's what the writers need to happen. Or why is Durin's dad such a fucking dickhead? Hint, because the plot needs him to be. Or the story's actually trying to make us question if the person who ultimately defeats Sauron is alive or not. I'll just go fuck myself. Considering how little the show gives a shit about following the lore, though, I guess he could be dead. I gave the show the benefit of the doubt that the stranger couldn't possibly be Gandalf, because that's a little too fucking obvious. But then he was. Pretty sure making the audience think you're not that uncreative, and then showing us that you are, isn't the kind of subversion of expectations you want to go for, but okay. The show doesn't just rely on mystery boxes, it's wrapped entirely in contrived storytelling techniques that amplify a lack of creativity. Like the tree dying that's killing the elves. It's dying because, well, that's just what needs to happen, okay? Or, the benefit of the doubt I gave the show all the way to episode 8, that when Galadriel first ran into Chad, it wasn't just a bullshit contrived way to get them together. Turns out, it really was. Galadriel jumped into the ocean, and while swimming in thousands of miles of water, didn't just run into a random raft, but a raft carrying fucking Sauron himself. And both of them run into one ship that just so happened to be passing by them, and in a world filled with hostile people, the ship is being charted by folks nice enough to take them aboard. Who luckily live in a land run by a pushover, so Galadriel can bully her way into acquiring their fucking army to go do what she wants to do. How lucky all this happened. It's like everything just fell into place. A man and an elf, together. Circumstances arose. We are companions by chance. When you sit back and realize the sheer luck involved in all this, the story starts to sink like the fucking Titanic. The show tries to spread this out over 9 hours, in hopes to hide all this, but once you reach the end you realize how fucking contrived it all is. And you had to be bored to death for the length of 3 movies just to realize it in the end. About 8.5 hours in and the only thing that happens is some characters get introduced, a fight happens, and Mordor gets created thanks to the most contrived and idiotic Rube Goldberg device you can imagine. Turn a key and the mountain goes boom. 
Go fuck yourself. This is from the perspective of someone looking at it minus the desecration of the lore, too. The Rings of Power simply does not work as a coherent narrative that stands on its own. If you threw out all the offensive liberties it takes with Tolkien's work, it's a steaming pile of shit all the same. I haven't really thought about this until now, but they have this big confrontation and conversation in the pilot, and then that conversation is sort of mirrored. I saw that. And, cool, and, cool, and, great. I'm glad. I, I don't think I did until just now. <laughs> in this interview, the showrunners admit to the fact that they don't even have the answers to their own mystery boxes yet. They just set it up with the hopes that they'll figure out the payoff later. Or worse, that they'll pull a Zack Snyder, let people speculate and come up with ideas, and if a reasonable answer pops up, they'll say, oh yeah, that's totally what we were doing. This interview contradicts interviews they've given prior to the release of the series, and they're clearly lying about the fact that they have the entire series planned out. They don't. At this point in time, all these contrivances were really conceived as pure luck within the context of the story. They could retcon this drivel in the future, but I'll bet a dollar and a handshake they don't even bother if they get past the second season. Rings of Power is incredibly hollow, and there's a reason why the majority of positive reviews have stuck to talking about how visually stunning the show is, rather than complimenting or touching on the story as a strength. In fact, now that the show's over, the access media seems to be turning on it. Or, you could also say, finally telling the truth about it. Even if it lacks visuals, a compelling story can make endearing television. It's why a show like Buffy the Vampire Slayer is still held in such high esteem, despite it not holding up visually. And did it even look good in the 90s? And we don't have to look very far away from the Rings of Power to understand why Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, the trilogy this series so desperately wishes it was, to find something that holds up to this day in no small part because of how beloved and cherished the interpretations of Tolkien's characters are. Digital effects can be incredible tools, and I'd be a fool to suggest it takes anything but obscene talent, dedication, and hard work. So I am by no means trying to diminish the artistic merits of the people who gave it their all bringing a beautiful aesthetic to this show. But a beautiful picture will never make up for a lack of depth in the writing. I mean, honestly, the show is between a rock and a hard place. They wanted a Lord of the Rings show, but don't have the rights to anything other than some pages from the appendices and the Lord of the Rings novels themselves. So what to do? The showrunners aren't good enough to write original content, obviously. Otherwise, Amazon wouldn't have purchased this IP to sell this product. So they write themselves into a corner trying to appeal the fans of the films aesthetically, or just lifting lines directly from characters that will be speaking the same words thousands of years in this story's future, all for a little hint of nostalgia. Give it to us. And give me the meat and give it to me raw. It's enlisting the hope of nostalgia to get you through the day. Because another flaw of this show is the constant use of member berries. I've heard this argument a few times. Wow, really weird that the show uses things that are related to Middle Earth. If that's what you take away from the member berry criticism, then yeah, this show is definitely for you. And I bet The Force Awakens is your favorite Star Wars movie. Much like that half-assed film was eventually realized as nothing but smoke and mirrors, basically a new hope all over again, this show in a lot of ways tries to be Lord of the Rings because it wants to be Lord of the Rings. How do we retell a lot of the same story without retelling it? How much can we get away with rehashing that story again? We live in a world of soft reboots and nostalgia bait movies, and hopefully this era of film is coming to an end soon because it's getting fucking sickening, relying on the good times of people's past instead of making something new and fresh. Oh, Jurassic World is so good. They brought the T-Rex back. Remember the T-Rex? Oh my god, I love the T-Rex. Remember Jeff Goldblum? Oh my god, I remember Jeff Goldblum. He was fantastic. I criticized the quick visual of Ents in episode 1 in my last video, and for good reason. They weren't anywhere to be found in the rest of the season. They were there strictly for the member berries. The showrunners have even opened up and admitted that for season 2, they'll try and give viewers what they were expecting out of season 1. And my question is, why didn't you do that in the first place? World building, I'm sure, is the primary excuse. With the showrunners constantly playing defense and making excuses for the mistakes of season 1, it really paints a beautiful portrait of how sad it is that people are defending the show as some sort of masterpiece. If this is peak television, art is fucking doomed. There are plenty of shows and movies that do world building while still giving us actively engaging, likable characters that we can get invested in. Speaking of characters, a simple story can sometimes be elevated by our love of the characters. That doesn't apply here. The characters of Rings of Power are sometimes shitty versions of beloved ones from Tolkien's work, other times completely made up and seem to exist solely because... reasons. 
I'm talking specifically about discount legalists in Little House on the Patriarchy, whose stories add a total of zero to the overall plot in the end, relegated to simply eating up screen time and padding in some action scenes, as well as an excuse to have the Hollywood requirement of a stunning and brave female character. Either way, almost every character comes off as flat, their story, their motivations are often shaky, and the acting itself is flatter than the guard in Austin Powers. I don't think it's necessarily the fault of the actors. This seems a lot more like a direction and writing issue. Too often, the actors seem to not know how to handle a scene. They often play it as pure melodrama, but it comes off like a high school play and ends up being about as compelling as eight hours of C-SPAN. The harshest of all realizations is that our main character Gladriel is the worst out of every character. I don't think I've ever watched a show where I've disliked a protagonist more. Shit, at least with she, her Hulk, Tatiana Maslany's a good actress. I didn't like her character, but she had some charm about her. Morphid Clark has enough range to challenge Tessa Thompson for the least amount of facial expressions possible. In the two times I can think of where she isn't looking like a fucking robot, it comes off goofy as fuck and just plain cringe-inducing. Die because of me! The writers fall into the trap that most modern shows do trying to force us as an audience to accept and like a character that they don't even try to make likable in any way. Instead, she's pushy at her lowest moments and hilariously over-the-top angry in others. She's manipulative and convinces people to do things that ultimately lead to their downfall or ends up getting them hurt. She threatens people that have been nothing but good to her. She leaves her own people for dead for her own selfish reasons then questions why they would abandon her as if that's some sort of fucking mystery, and looks down at others for doing the exact same thing she's done. Oh, oh, oh. Wait, no! We keep moving! I'm simply wondering what manner of man would so readily abandon his companions to death. She's responsible for bringing the Dark Lord Sauron himself back to Middle-earth, yet somehow this fucking wench fails upward and ends the season acquiring one of the three elven rings of power. She's the Middle-earth equivalent of Scarlet Witch after she enslaved an entire town. This will be your only warning. Stay out of my home. But we're apparently supposed to feel sympathy for her when she decides to stop being a selfish, manipulative, horrible human being. If you won't let us go, just let us die. They'll never know what you sacrificed for them. As always, the problems can be traced back to the writing. It's all about the writing. A character is only as smart or clever as the writer. The way Gladriel's portrayed is just the biggest offender of a running theme throughout the show, of characters experiencing consequences that seem simply illogical at best. She bullies people into submission or threatens people that saved her, yet basically gets rewarded for it, while someone like Isildur gets punished because one time he let go of a fucking rope on a ship. <laughs> I let it slip. That was deliberate. You're off the sea, God! Characters are constantly reaping consequences that the writers need them to experience rather than consequences that would naturally happen to them. Also known as and-then storytelling. The writer needs X to happen, so instead of finding a natural way to get there, they just force things into existence because, let's face it, it's the easy way out. The one bright spot of the show is the relationship between Durin and Elrond, and even that is often overshadowed by idiotic plot devices and the often embarrassing dialogue. The dog may bark at the moon, but he cannot bring it down. Even though the guy looks like Dr. Oz, I can honestly say I enjoyed whoever this actor's take is on Elrond, and the actor playing Durin does a great job. Not good enough to make up for all the faults of everything around him, but the guy at least has plenty of range, and was the reason there's a single scene of the show where I felt something other than apathy. Delrond! Their friendship is the only thing I liked about this entire show. They were the only characters who played well off each other, and had a few moments of levity in an otherwise paltry, ham-fisted melodrama. If there was one part of this show that was a reminder of Peter Jackson's film trilogy that was done positively, instead of eliciting disdain for daring and failing to emulate it, this was it. 
Amazon started this whole debacle because they wanted a pop culture encompassing show to expand their streaming empire, but apparently couldn't find an original idea to save its life. So like a pop star who can't make a hit by themselves, they decided to purchase the Lord of the Rings name for an obscene amount of money. After Amazon got involved in this project, my son came up to me and he said, Dad, please don't F this up. Oops. Now, I understand that Hollywood's a business, but the thing about adapting something like Lord of the Rings is that it's going to come with a lot of expectations. A lot more than adapting a superhero into film, and a lot more than, well, almost anything I can think of. It's so beloved that there needs to be true artistic merit behind every facet of it. Like most people, I obsessively watched the appendices of the DVD extras when the Lord of the Rings Extended Editions came out back in the day, and I fondly recall how lovingly crafted those movies were and the respect Jackson put into them. He didn't want to do anything that wasn't necessary. Yes, liberties were taken to change the story at times when he didn't think it could necessarily translate well over to film, but without a doubt, the heart and soul of Tolkien was there. The films didn't just hold monetary value, there's artistic merit to them, made with the desire to really adapt a work of art into its own work of art. That's why they're considered some of the best films ever made. The Rings of Power, on the other hand, exists solely for the sake of making money for Amazon. And not only that, but making money for Amazon off of the Lord of the Rings IP because they couldn't come up with an original fantasy series to call their own. It doesn't exist to add anything to or flesh out Tolkien's world via film, or they would have gone full force in trying to purchase the rights to the Silmarillion. This series exists to maintain and gain new subscribers to their streaming service, and only for that purpose. Fuck integrity, it only focuses on the monetary merit. Thing is, Amazon wanted to have their cake and eat it too, but without putting the work in where it mattered in order to get there and still expecting people to praise it like they had. Did they go out of their way to make a bad show? I'd never suggest that, but they put their focus in the wrong area. Amazon surely wanted Rings of Power to be a cultural moment on par with Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad. Now, say my name. Eisenberg. Goddamn right. But you have not seen what I've seen. I have seen my share. You have not seen what I have seen. <laughs> and when they didn't, I find articles like this. Rings of Power is not a water cooler show, and that's okay. An unbelievable excuse, because there's no way they wanted a mid-as-fuck TV show. That's just what they produced. They wanted this show to be talked about, to be analyzed positively, and have people buzzing every week in excitement. You don't spend a billion dollars with the intent to produce mediocrity, but once you've realized you've made a mistake, what's the best thing to do to get people talking? Make fucking excuses, point fingers, and blame others to stir the pot. And who better to blame than the fans? Unless season two has the ultimate turnaround, this show will live on only as a piece of controversy, and one stirred completely by the company and showrunners who produced it. Judging by how late in the game they finally started releasing any trailers, photos, or details about the show, and now that I've seen the entire thing, it's safe to say they knew they had a turd on their hands. A recent article begged the question of why keyboard warriors can't emit the show along with She-Hulk is a success both commercially and critically. If you ask defenders of the show, it's a borderline masterpiece, the peak of programming. Thank you so much. You guys have created a masterpiece. Oh my god, stop. <laughs> <laughs> too hyperbolic, but honestly, I appreciate this show even more the second watch through. When you hide the viewership numbers once they start to dwindle, and hide any negative feedback about the show and then criticize your own fans, I'm pretty sure that answers the question right there. Because it's neither. Those damn fans who speak negatively about the show are so toxic. Not like the fans who love the show. Like defenders of the show popping up in my comment section in my last Rings of Power video, they are understanding, accept criticism, and are never rude at all. The thing about art is it simply speaks for itself. If the show was good, they wouldn't need to defend it so vehemently because the negative voices would be drowned out. You wouldn't have to block negative reviews, use ist or ism words to describe anyone who dare criticize the show, and you wouldn't have to literally call people who have a negative opinion of it patently evil. In that article, they were vague in who exactly they were describing when hurling that, which in turn painted everyone with a bad critique of the show as literally fucking evil. I've never seen anything like this. Oh wait. Oh wait. Yes I have.
As has been pointed out by the likes of Critical Drinker, Mahler, and others, fan baiting is a real thing and it's out in full force with this show. How to get people talking about something that no one is actually excited for? Just tell them that they didn't like the show because a person of a different race was starring in it or that it has a female lead. That'll certainly get people talking. And any publicity is good publicity, right? Media companies have done an incredible job finding new ways to get people buzzing about a show, and it feeds right into the social media cultural movement of the last decade and a half. Who cares if people hate watch a show? At least they're watching it. And you can simply block their reviews of it, make it look like people adore it at a glance, and then take out articles and media outlets that continue stirring that cultural pot. It's brilliant stuff. Unfortunately for them, they're left with a show that fails regardless of whatever they think the fans dislike it for. No, no one fucking cares that there's black elves or that there's a woman protagonist. What we care about is the fact that the show is written like a fucking high school student did it. Fan fiction is at least written by people who have a genuine love for the intellectual property. Rings of Power seems like it was written by people who think they can improve on something that's already beloved. As if they're saying, yeah, it's good, but times have changed and we're here to fix it. Sorry, but mystery box storytelling, cringe-inducing dialogue, a plot that relies on pure luck and convenience, and CGI that ranges from great to oddly shitty isn't improving on something that's already considered a masterpiece. I criticize the bejesus out of She-Hulk writers, but after the staunch defense they put up while calling critics of the show patently evil, I can plainly say this to the showrunners of Rings of Power. Get fucked! Thank, Thank you. you. Episode, Episode 1, one. The show opens with the prologue like Peter Jackson's films because it wants you to remember how awesome that was and hopefully pass some of that adoration onto the show. For those not easily duped, this will be a recognizable ongoing theme and grows tiresome pretty quickly. Galadriel, or Galadriel as some people in the show call her, is building a stupid boat out of stupid paper that somehow requires idiotic pseudo-philosophical reasoning by her brother. This, of course, is after the writers decide to go the Captain Marvel route and have strong female belittled and bullied by weak male. Whenever you can emulate Brie Larson in Captain Marvel, I strongly advise you to. Anyway, she beats up the kid who threw rocks at it for no reason, other than to have the writers show Gladriel don't take no shit. Fast forward to her leading a bunch of elves to hunt for orc or whatever because she needs to avenge her brother's death. Gladriel is the best kind of leader. She doesn't listen to anyone else, talks shit to her apparent subordinates, and knows exactly what she's doing because, obviously, she's driven solely by revenge and doesn't give a fuck about her team. This is also when we're graced with Morphic Clark's acting, which is about as exciting as Ben Stein playing Ferris Bueller's teacher. Holly Smoot, Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs. This is apparently the trope Hollywood's gonna be running with their female-led movies and shows, also known as the Mary Sue. She knows what's right, because of course she does. And she'll be questioned at every turn because of course she will. And in the end, she will absolutely be right because of course she is. Very nuanced, guys. Oh, remember Cave Trolls? Oh, I remember they were fantastic. This is where I realized what was in store for me. Member berries. Lots of them. I honestly didn't anticipate the creators trying for a nostalgia bait style show, but here we are. It's pretty revealing they kick the show off in this way because it's supposed to remind us of the excitement of the troll encounter in Fellowship of the Ring, but it's different because it's a snow troll, not your run-of-the-mill troll. It's a great example of the showrunners trying to be Peter Jackson's movies but also desiring to separate themselves. I'm wondering when Hollywood's going to realize emulating a previous experience just makes people yearn for the original one and highlights the inferiority of the replica before us. When I was watching this, right as the troll showed up, I said out loud, let me guess, Gladriel's going to be the one to defeat it after the other ones get their asses kicked. So what happens, you ask? Well, they all get their asses handed to them by the troll when the strong, boring Whammon beats it completely by herself. Talk about subverting my expectations, this shit is awesome. Strong Whammon jumps up like, Yeah, fuck you, physics! And doesn't even look at her enemy as she whoops its ass. I hope you were in awe of the laughable fight choreography and shitty CGI like I was. If they were going for something that felt like it was ripped straight from a CW show, they did a fantastic job. Also, wasn't she leading these people to potentially fight orcs? Aren't they supposed to be badass? They just got their asses handed to them by a snow troll and she beat it by herself. Hey guys, not sure if you're aware, but... She's, she's fucking, fucking tough. tough! At this point, I looked at the time and couldn't believe it had been 18 minutes already. Fucking nothing has happened so far, but the music would tell you otherwise. 
It's loud and booming, but it feels so out of scale with what's happening on screen. It's trying to engage the audience like it's trying to make up for a lack of excitement on the screen. It feels like the music's compensating and trying too hard because the show has to be epic. Now we're switching to when all the addicts come out when they hear the meth cream man. These are hobbits. I mean, Harfoots. I get they're an ancestor of hobbits or whatever, but you know what the creators are doing. See guys, it's exactly like you remember, so you'll love it. It's also totally different and stands on its own. We get an extended scene trying to replicate the fun, heartfelt scenes of Hobbiton from the film trilogy. It of course ends up, once again, feeling like a wannabe version of something superior. Side note, huge fan of the Harfoots having mismatched accents. In one scene, a character switches from Irish to American to British accents in three sentences. Good stuff, guys. Flipping back to the elves, we're introduced to the Wish.com version of Orlando Bloom playing Elrond. I'll bet a dollar and a handshake they cast this dude to give people a subconscious member berry of Legolas. We get to see strong whammon and wannabe Bloom walking around some expensive looking CGI. Talk about overcompensating. Anyway, yeah, so they walk around and strong whammon acts all petulant, defiant, and whatnot because, obviously. When she was doing this, it reminded me of the original Thor movie. Even though the movie wasn't amazing by any stretch, the writing at least understood the character and painted him as petulant for the audience, even though we appreciated his charisma and looked forward to how he would redeem himself. You'd stand giving speeches while Asgard falls. You are a vain, greedy, cruel boy! And you are an old man and a fool! Here, Strong Whammon is just petulant, but we're not supposed to think of her that way. No, no, we're supposed to be on her side. But you have not seen what I've seen. I have seen my share. You have not seen what I have seen. Okay, I need to stop right here, just for a moment. This line really encapsulates the limp noodle way the dialogue's written. Remember now, this television series isn't really adapting anything. And now think of the Lord of the Rings trilogy again. The dialogue from those films was ripped straight from the pages of Tolkien, which is why it always sounded so elegant, eloquent, and almost poetic. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. Bilbo was meant to find the ring. In which case, you also were meant to have it. And that is an encouraging thought. Now put yourself in modern day little writer shoes and think of little writer things to have the characters say. And don't forget, you're writing something in Tolkien's world. Now, think about the sheer fucking hubris it takes to actually believe you can follow Tolkien. And not only that, but demand praise for the show you're writing. To actually think someone else could write Tolkien's world, let alone imitate his words, and be on par with, or as I'm sure the folks at Amazon would love, to exceed something he's done is the most narcissistic thing in modern pop culture. Yeah folks, that's what this line of dialogue made me realize. This show shouldn't fucking exist. But we carry on, don't we? The high quality writing continues on full display here. For the 20th time already, we're told how good of friends Strong Whammon and Orlando Bloom.0 are instead of showing us in any nuanced or subtle way. Just told, that's all. Yep, got it guys. Quality storytelling techniques here. Taking the show-don't-tell writing advice and shoving it right up your own asses, huh? Was there anything else? Yes, your friend has arrived. Now we flip to another set of incredibly wooden and uninteresting characters played by people who are about as exciting as a colonoscopy. Apparently some bad shit is going down, or whatever, who cares. I understand the world they're trying to build, and I can appreciate that there are going to be a lot of characters, but there's just nothing cohesive here narratively. There's nothing to invest in. All the characters are boring as fuck, and keep reminding me that there's a better version of this material elsewhere. Tolkien introduced his characters into the main story slower, focusing on Frodo and the Hobbits for the majority of the Fellowship's opening, but here we just jump, and then jump, and then jump. And so far, there isn't a single character I've looked forward to seeing again. Well, the same wind that seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its spread. SHUT UP! SHUT THE FUCK UP! This dialogue makes me wish I was deaf. Well, and blind. Then I couldn't read the subtitles either. Hey, at least they have some great aestheticians in Middle-earth because her eyebrows are killing it today. We conclude this boring-ass episode with a climax, I guess. Strong Whammon decides to stay in Middle-earth and jumps overboard. Some shit is going down somewhere or something and uh, Dumbledore arrives. Even if this guy doesn't end up being Gandalf, it's who the show wants you to think of. So what is this? Member Barry number 104? Oh wait, don't forget Ents! Oh, member Ents? Member? Alright, so that concludes my review of Rings of Pa- Wait!
There's a second episode? God damn it! When is this nightmare gonna stop? It's gonna run for five seasons. Five seasons? I legitimately fell asleep during the first episode. I had to wake up and rewind it. The show was just that goddamn boring. When I went to watch the second episode, I assumed my nap would be sufficient to get me through the entirety of it, but I fell asleep during the second episode too. Somehow, some way, Amazon's figured out a way to make two hours feel like an eternity. Anyway, let's dive in. Previously on Rings of Power. The show has to start with a recap of episode one, which basically just reminds you that they introduced some characters but had practically zero plot development whatsoever. I suppose this is here because it makes the show seem like a bigger deal. Dumbledore is bumbling around and some Harfoots are trying to figure him out or whatever. Meanwhile, Orlando Bloom 2.0 seeks out help from the dwarves for something, so... Well, so they can be introduced to the story, honestly. Oh, remember the door in Fellowship of the Ring? We shall break the great stones until one of us can break no more! (laughs) Whoa boy, looks like Orlando Bloom 2 is going to have to smash some rocks in a rock smashing competition if he wants to speak to Gimli. I mean, Gamli. I mean, whatever. Remember Gimli? Smashing rocks can be pretty compelling. I am stoked for this. This is the scene where I realized the prosthetics, makeup, and wardrobe fell woefully short of expectations considering the budget. OG Gimli's nose is observable as a prosthetic from the surface of the moon, it's so bad. And I guess they got the costume designers from the CW too. I'm pretty sure Hercules the Legendary Journeys in the 90s had better costume design than this show. Flip back over to Strong Women after she jumped from her boat and she's swimming in the calmest ocean water I've ever seen. As the plot requires, she stumbles across the makeshift raft filled with people being attacked by Godzilla. If you're feeling sleepy, this is your lucky day. The episode continues providing zero reason to be invested in any of the characters whatsoever, particularly our main character, so rest your eyes, tired one. It's nap time. The handsome toxic dude who was suspicious of strong women is the only survivor of the attack besides her because, well, obviously. And back to the exhilarating rock-breaking contest. This is compelling television, folks. Now, get ready for the most epic line of dialogue yet. A dog may bark at the moon, but he cannot bring it down. Oh man, the chills I felt hearing this. The unparalleled writing prowess of the showrunners. Tolkien would bow to their superiority. Admittedly, the one quality bit of acting in the show so far is from Durin the Dwarf, and actually feels like he could form into a three-dimensional character and not a stoic plank of wood. Twenty years may be the blink of an eye to an elf, but I've lived an entire life in that time. A life you missed. And of course, we now jump back to strong women, who just so happen to run into the person who will give her information to drive the plot forward. Are you going to tell me where the enemy is or not? The Southlands. while she was randomly swimming in the fucking ocean. And now let's jump back to the elf human love story thing again, where I made the observation in my notes here that the uh, editing is actually pretty poor in the show too. As an orc attacks, I actually wanted to heap a little praise here. There's an appreciation I have for practical effects and costumes, and the Hobbit trilogy got so far away from that it gave me the big sad. The show at least wisely went back to a mostly practical costume for the orcs, and I'm thankful for that. There you go. I've given you two things that are good. Out of two hours. Chad saves strong women without an inkling of a compelling reason to, other than having the audience go, Well, of course, that's what they do in stories. There's zero chemistry between these characters, and I'm not entirely sure if it's the actors or the writing, but honestly, it's probably a combination of both. There's zero interesting expressions shown between these characters, and no mutual ground or commonalities discussed. They just do what the plot needs them to do. And with that, thankfully, episode two's over. And hell, might as well review episode three while I'm here. Episode three starts off with our elf lead captured by orcs, then flips straight to strong women and Chad after they've been rescued by early 2000s Russell Crowe and brought to Numenor. Does Numenor look beautiful? Absolutely. But that hollow feeling that's been there since episode one persists. There's simply no heart to this show. It's like looking at a beautiful digital painting. Impressive? Sure. Good? Your mileage may vary. Strong Women confronts Shocked Women about leaving, and they uh, end up staying in Numenor because reasons, and we cut away to be introduced to even more new characters. And we get this brilliant line. The sea is all 
always right. The C is always right. Johnny's sins officially one-upped. Then, bam, 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 bam. we're back to the captured elf. The orcs give the prisoners some water, and when one of the kidnapped people is drinking it, an orc slices away. And I'm assuming we're supposed to feel really sad. At least that's what the music's telling us. I'm mourning this dude like I mourned Wade and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Alright, right behind you. Wade! It's that intense, man. Wade didn't deserve it. The scene continues to drive the point home that two and a half hours into this show, there isn't a single character the audience has grown attached to in the slightest, because they're all just hollow, planks of wood. And this dude? Did anyone even catch this guy's name? Who cares? Going back to Strong Women, she threatens her rescuer who ends up being able to speak Elvish. Lali Sanke Luilquen, Erinia. And holy shit, Strong Women's facial expression actually changed. Her lips raised slightly, almost like a wry smile. Nah, too nuanced. I don't believe it. Eyes deceive me. Whoa, whoa, now she's smiling, and it looks terrifying. What the fuck? Next up, Chad tries to get on the good side of the locals, and to be fair, I actually really like this line. You're not so bad, low man. Hmm. Well, then I best make my retreat. Well, you still got a warm opinion of me. Clever. So what's that? Three good moments so far in two and a half hours? This potentially could have been a cool little fight scene, but the choreography is just slow and dull and cheesy looking. And these are things that are just clearly not going to improve as the show goes on. We now return to the Harfoots, where the creators continue trying and failing at replicating the fun of Hobbiton. Dumbledore walks over to a fire to take a look at a map, and somehow the Harfoots, standing a couple feet away, don't notice some towering figure just standing there, until he slips on a banana peel and makes a ruckus. <laughs> Junior Harfoot gets in trouble for mingling with the Slender Man, and her whole family is subsequently punished for it. Go right back to Strong Women, who finds Chad in a jail cell, and she identifies him as the king of his land or whatever. Basically, it's supposed to remind you of Aragorn's storyline. You are more than you claim. I found this in the Hall of Law. Impressive. Very nice. The episode ends with the prisoners attacking their orc captors and we're treated to a sci-fi channel quality CGI creature. If the only reason to watch this show is to look at how pretty it is, this isn't doing you any favors. They even recycle some sound effects from other films for its bark slash roar thing. Our elvish friend hates gravity more than Gladriel and he fucks that thing up. Also, twigs are deadly. We follow that up with a, I wish this was anywhere near as epic as Baromir's death scene, and thankfully, the episode is finally over. And god, this one episode felt like it was three hours long. Rings of Power, Episode 4. Episode 4 covers a whole lot of things while covering extremely little ground all at once. Bootleg Legolas gets freed by the Orc Daddy to give a warning to the village that they're coming for them, because it's always a good idea to give your enemies prep time. Mithril's discovered, and apparently has magical capabilities, because the showrunners decided that was a smart idea. Galadriel bullies her way into getting the Woman King to give her her army to satiate her vengeance narrative. And Isildur... fucking whatever. Who cares? His story is so boring and insignificant, it doesn't matter. Oh, and the episode has race relation allegories by having the Numenorians pissed that the elves took their jobs. I'm not even fucking kidding. One as boundless as a sunrise over the rolling sea. Ah, uh, yeah. My favorite ham fisted dialogue trying to emulate something superior. Tolkien's work. Fucking cringe. Elf ships on our shore. Elf workers taking your trades. They took our job. They took our job. They took your job. They took your job. I say. The queen's either blind or an elf lover, just like her father. They took our jobs! Just some fucking race-baiting rebel rouser over here. As Drinker said, it needs to reflect the world we live in today, I guess. I can't believe this isn't a fantasy show. I believe the man you hold in your dungeons is no common brawler, but the lost heir in exile to the throne of the Southland. Stunning and brave woman tries to explain who not Sauron is to Woman King. You do not understand Galadriel, daughter of Finarfin. And you should stand aside. Then I might present my proposal to one who holds the authority to answer it. Oh shit, can't fight. Meow. 
Or are you a castaway, grasping for a handhold in a tempest? There is a tempest in me! Christ, man, the acting is so awful. Couple that with the dialogue. Ugh. Like I said, Morphid Clark is basically Tessa Thompson 2.0. Young blood. His appearance didn't give it away that he's young. And here you go, mystery box shit. This one, who's Orc Daddy? These winds are turning my mind to mush. He was off to mine quartz chasm today. You know, Disa, there is no secret worth concealing with deception. Disa, played by Sofia Nonvetti, is legitimately the best character in this show. Considering how good Dr. Oz and Discount Gimli's chemistry is, I wish she got more screen time along with them. This is also where the fan baiting by Amazon becomes obvious, because I think it's near universally agreed that she's the best actor and character here after all. The old mind below the mirror mirror. Even camera angles and certain shots in the show look wonky as fuck. Lighter than silk, harder than iron as weaponry, it would best have proudest blades. Me thrill. I'm not sure if this was in the appendices, but it seems like it's reaching to make the origin of Mithril, or Mithril itself, something of significance in the show's storyline. Much like Captain Marvel did with Nick Fury, did I need to see how he lost his eye? Did I need to know the Joker's origin? Did I need to know Hannibal Lecter's? And it's not even interesting. It's partially Membaberry, partially we need a reason to do the thing. Let's include something people know. And its origin isn't even clever, it's discovered through mining. Wow. Neat. So basically, exactly like I would have figured. In this scene though, we really start to see Durin and Elrond's friendship as a highlight of this shitty show. Or at least allowing it to have some sort of respectable character and actor integration. There's some reasonably well done acting that's propping up an unbearably bland script. And the actors have genuine chemistry. It seems to me that you do well to identify what it is that your opponent most fears. Give them a means of mastering it so that you can master them. This dude's totally not Sauron. He's not conniving or sounding manipulative or anything. Apparently the actor didn't know he was Sauron until multiple episodes into filming. And like, just how? This is where the show really started to wear me down because it's a perfect culmination of everything wrong with it. First, I'll get this out of the way. The catching of the arrow is really cool. Slick idea. But they of course have to do it in slow-mo. Hi Zack Snyder. If you know my opinion on Zack Snyder, you know I am not particularly fond of that. What is Zack Snyder known for? People would think I was known for slow motion. I like slow motion. I don't really like slow motion that much. I don't really like slow motion that much. I don't really like slow motion that much. The application of slow motion in this instance is supposed to imply drama. It's supposed to create a sense of tension for the audience. Unfortunately, we're not invested in the characters whatsoever, nor do we actually feel scared for their safety anyway. Imply drama where there is none. Demanded tension when there's nothing to be found. All because the script hasn't given us a single reason to give a flying fuck about these characters. The music here is genuinely misplaced too. The implied and desired mood of the scene doesn't fit or seem like the right choice considering what's actually happening. The musical score has been a huge problem that I mentioned in my previous video, but it really ramps it up throughout the remaining episodes. It's like the music's trying to make up for a lack of weight in the script, and in doing so becomes overbearing and actually brought me out of the show even more than I already was because of how misplaced it felt. I can almost feel the showrunners screaming at the composer about being more and more epic. Give him time. Even the hottest calls eventually cool. I wish sometimes I wish they wouldn't. More brilliant lines from Lord of the Cringe. Wings of Power, Episode 5. 
Okay, so in this episode, the stranger protects the discount Frodo and friends from some wolves. The elves need Mithril's showrunners made up healing powers to stop them from dying. Galadriel bullies people into submission till they decide to send an army with her to fight orcs in the Southlands. And Little House on the Patriarchy and Discount Legolas prep to fight said orcs. Boom. Exciting shit. I cannot get over the fact that they put grass and shit in the Harfoot's hair. Hey. How do we show that not hobbits are of the earth? Why don't we, like, put earth in their fucking hair? Genius. Not all who wander or wander are lost. Oi! All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. Not all who wander or wander Shut up! Shut the fuck up! Oh. Dumbledore pulls an average American on the 4th of July and almost blows his hand off. Galadriel is going to teach these badasses how to fight. Look, the strong whammon arc gets a little old. If this was the MCU, when it was good, and say Black Widow was doing this, yeah, we'd absolutely accept it, because we liked her. We'd understand she'd be able to outmaneuver multiple people at once, but this doesn't feel earned, especially because as an audience member, I don't like this character. And at the very least, this looks absolutely fucking ridiculous and is choreographed and shot so poorly that it's laughable. Still can't stop thinking about all the folks who were shocked this dude Sauron, both in the show and in the audience. Your loyalty to the dwarf is admirable. Loyalty to a friend ought to be expected, regardless of his race. <sighs> Jesus. Did the dwarves find the ore or not? I swore an oath to Durin. I don't know, big guy. Pretty sure you can take that as a yes. A horse master recruited him. Sorry, Isil. I see he's always right. Shut the fuck up! We must first touch the darkness. What do you know of darkness? You have not seen what I have seen. We're all about to be buried in this tower, so why be buried with us? I've come to know the voices and the hands of those behind them. Half of us just left, but half stayed, including you. Discount Legolas feels like a different character than he did in the previous four episodes. It's weird. In the first, he was kind of a rugged dickhead, even around the kid who he's being nice to right now. It just feels like the writers are having him do whatever they need him to do and be whatever the plot needs him to be. Someone described it as the actors not understanding what kind of show they're supposed to be in, and this is a perfect example of that. Just a key. A key to what? Giving the orcs a home in these lands. A key to create Mordor. This is, by far, the stupidest MacGuffin I've seen in modern entertainment. From where did you procure the table? So rarely do a resonator is locate a deposit. We consider each to be a precious gift. We shall have to send it home with you so it can be treated with the proper respect. <laughs> You made it up, didn't you? This has been wanting a new table for years, so... <laughs> this is a cute character moment between the two that I genuinely appreciated, until... Give me the meat, and give it to me raw. What the fuck? Uh, how exactly are 500 men fitting on these boats? What the fuck? Someone on Twitter did a drawing of how the writers thought boats must work, and I love this. Rings of Power, episode 6. six. This one is the big ol' fight scene. That's it. Big ol' beat him up. And Mordor gets created through process of idiocy. Our enemy vows to attack. Who among you will stand? The copy and paste people here is fucking embarrassing. Holy shit. His mother. What happened to her? This next line is amazing. You think he's giving some melodramatic speech, then turns the 90 degrees on a dime and answers her question. It's the most hilariously out of place, jarring writing in the show, right here. It is strange. Most of my life I've looked east to see the sun rise over the sea. We're sailing into the dawn, and yet to me, it feels like the coming of night.
She drowned. We must wait until every last orc has crossed that bridge to spring our attack. To your positions. Little House on the Patriarchy and Discount Legolas are leading them. I understand Discount Legolas, but why her? What the fuck has she done whatsoever to be the one leading them? And how is she now some sort of tactician? Simple answer, it's the writer's choice. It doesn't make natural sense, but it's what the writers wanted to happen. But it's fiction. What happens in the story is obviously what the writers want to happen. Well, you're not wrong. Characters do what the writers want. Yep, but that sort of argument would mean that there is no objective barometer for quality in writing. If that argument held any weight, then all writing would be of equal value, and it's simply not. Characters either make sense with the established world built around them, or they do not. This character, doing these things, does not make sense other than, well, we want her to. I also find it difficult to connect with this rousing speech because, once again... I've connected with none of these characters. I know I've repeated this, but watching this show is more like being a passenger. Like watching something as a sequence of events from far away. Like watching a history documentary minus the narration. Visually being told these things happened, and then this thing happened, and then this thing happened. It is a strange fate that we should suffer so much fear and doubt over so small a thing. Why sacrifice their lives? For such a little thing. Oi! Commander of the Northern Armies. Galadriel. Anyone else tired of how they say her name? And no, it's not Galadriel. That's strong women. Thank you very much. You remember me? I split him open. I killed Sauron. And even after this, people were still shocked at the reveal of Halbrand being Sauron. I smell bullshit. Mountain go boom. Do volcanoes work like this? I don't know because who cares, right? It's a fantasy show. Except I can't suspend my disbelief because of how fucking contrived and stupid it is that Mount Doom, in Vicariously Mordor, is created thanks to a fucking Rube Goldberg device. Rings of Power, episode 7. In this episode, Elrond gets denied of the Mithril because Durin's dad is a dickhead and the Southlands is obviously Mordor. What a fucking banger. Stay with me. Every person here is going to die of smoke inhalation or suffer long-term effects. Is Galadriel going to help anyone that actually needs it? The kid is fine besides the long-term effects he would suffer, that I'm sure he somehow won't because of reasons. But there's a fucking dude on fire that's in torturous pain not 10 feet from her. What the fuck? People are shouting everywhere, why is she so casually walking away? Would it be because the writers want strong women and the who cares about this kid to have screen time together? I honestly don't even remember who this guy is, and I don't care. This is like the scene in episode 2 when the epic music played while the guy I didn't know got arrows to the chest, and my thought was, who gives a shit? Your friend up there. The big fella. You don't suppose... Suppose what? Maybe he could fix it. I'll ask him then. The Harfoots tell their own kind to get fucked if they fall behind or get injured, then ask them to have their friend help. And the Dwarf King says he won't risk sacrificing any possible Dwarven lives to save an entire race. Fuck man, people of Middle-earth are dogshit bastards in this show, huh? Derrant! The whole leaf coming back to life's cheesy as fuck, but as far as acting goes, this was really good. I mean, I genuinely enjoyed this. Fuck man, why can't any other aspect of this show be good? Why not make a show about these people? It has real potential and wouldn't upset fans of the lore either. The acting's great here, I don't mind admitting this made me actually feel something. Wait, why is Strong Woman and Who Gives a Fuck About This Kid away from the village? They say they need to regroup with the living. Newsflash, you fucking left them. So yes, this was written just to give these two characters time together. Better be a good reason why. Because wouldn't she or any of our leads stay behind to help those who are injured? 
They are the leaders, right? And how are they alive? Because every person there should be Darren Sheehan. I get that this is a fantasy show, but suspension of disbelief means following the rules that the show itself has established. There hasn't been anything to indicate our main heroes are somehow invulnerable. Anyone ever see Dante's Peak? You're fucking dead, man. Elrond is as much a brother to me as if he'd been fired in my own mother's womb. These cringe lines, man. And they're not done. Want some more? You harm my hair in her foot, and I'll brain the lot of you. Feminem makes Harfoot home go boom. Looks like Woman King has gone full can she on us. We stay true to each other. We face it. With our hearts even bigger in our feet. As he's looking right at the camera in the most embarrassing line of the entire show. I honestly thought this one was just for the trailers, but it's not. And how do they suggest they pick each other up? What's been established so far is that they just leave each other behind on account of injury. So far for them, it's been shown that if it comes down to, hey, I need help, you get a big ol' fucking nope. Here's a fine example of what I said earlier. That the script ignores established character traits when a rousing speech is in order. As long as it sounds good, I guess. Except it doesn't. And, of course, why wouldn't there be a Belrog? Gotta get them member berries flowing, because this is the only time you see him. This is our land now. This is our home. That is the name of a place that no longer exists. Or should we call it instead, Lord Father? So the Southlands is Mordor. Okay. Figured as much. Wait, are you fucking kidding me with the overlay text? If you were wondering who this show is actually for, this cinches it. The attack on fans made it clear they don't give a fuck about them, but the fact that they don't trust the audience enough to figure out on their own that this is Mordor lets you know this shit is exclusively for non-fans. Rings of Power, Episode 8. The final episode. We made it, Gandalf. Let's dance again. In this episode, Not Sauron reveals that he is Sauron and turns into an incel because strong women don't want no scrubs. And even though she's a fucking idiot who somehow didn't recognize that the dude she was parading around with was the Dark Lord himself, she doesn't tell a single soul and gets a ring of power because this is 2022 and gals can't do no wrong in media. Haru Sauron. Genuinely curious that this actually fooled anyone into thinking he was Sauron. Galadriel? <laughs> no, I told you. It's strong women. I should have trusted you. It is a mistake I will not make again. Why is this woman constantly failing upward? That wouldn't be suitable for this all. Why not? Because in the amounts we need, it would too greatly dilute its unique qualities. And couldn't the right alloy also amplify those qualities? Well, that is an intriguing suggestion. Isn't Kella Brimbor the dude who's like the Tom Brady of crafting? Why would the most simplistic suggestion baffle him like he had never thought of it before? Is this supposed to make Sauron appear smart, manipulative? So to do that, this is the best they could come up with? Because all it does is make both characters look like simpletons. It's like running out of shampoo and someone suggests putting a little water in the bottle and shaking it up and your mind is just fucking blown. It would be smaller than previously imagined. Something that could be carried. A scepter, perhaps. Or perhaps a crown. The tree's dying and that's what's killing him, right? And then it was laying next to the dead leaf and it brought it back to life, right? So why not just, like, stab the fucking tree with it or something? Lay it next to the tree. Melt it down and pour that shit on the tree. Anything. But nah, we need to come up with a reason to make the rings, so... Oh no, the unlikable not-Hobbit leader gets a knife to the gut. I give a shit. He is not Sauron. He is the other. The Easter. He is... I'm good. Nah, bro. When it comes to a season two, I think we're all good. Oh look, the androgynous things are Nas girls. So glad this entire side plot went absolutely fucking nowhere. Gotta keep a few of those mystery boxes going for season two, huh? Hold still. We'll find a way to carry it back. Oh really? You're gonna find a way to carry him back. 
I suggest you follow the advice he gave to the dude whose foot was broken. You're holding us up, buddy. Fucking see you later. This is... I don't even know. Is this bad acting? I mean, yeah, but whose fault is it? This is a director's fault. This is a writer's fault. This is everyone's fault that this is so fucking ridiculous. Supposing we've been using too much force. Meaning that the metals shouldn't be forced to join, but more drawn or coaxed. Quickly, dismantle this. We start again. What the fuck does this even mean? It's the most generic, idiotic advice given to a master craftsman, but the characters think it's genius. A big aha moment. Tell me who you are. You know who I am. Who you really are. I told you I found this on a dead man. No. I mentioned this before, but now we're here. Why wouldn't Chad just lie to her to keep his secret hidden? It'd be pretty easy to. There was an illegitimate child. Just anything. Yet another character just not doing the logical thing. Just deciding to be smug because we have to make this season feel like something happened. And even though it was extremely obvious, the Sauron reveal is that thing. You have been very brave. Yes, very stunning. And very brave. You would make me a tyrant. I would make you a queen. The Dark Lord. No. Not dark. Not with you at my side. So Sauron is big simpin' for Gladriel. Big yikes. Sauron lives because of you! And you will die because of me! <laughs> Sauron gets friend zone, so that's why he ultimately snaps. Sauron's an incel. To make this even more absurd, these camera angles are fucking horrendous and it makes it look goofy as shit. Where is Halbrand? He's gone. And I doubt he will return. And should he ever, none of us are to treat with him again. So you're just gonna let that mystery go, huh? Oh, this dude who helped create these tremendously powerful rings with his suggestions? We should never talk to him again if we see him now that he's disappeared. Eh, sure. Why not? Why the fuck not? So, do we proceed? No. We must make three. With three, there is balance. Why? Why three? Other than that's what the plot needs to happen. Perhaps it would be best if you lead off. I haven't an inkling which way to go. Always follow your nose. If you aren't an Anok, always follow your nose. Mystery box uncovered. He's Gandalf, meaning he's exactly who you thought he was. Expectation subverted because I gave the writers the benefit of the doubt that it wouldn't be Gandalf. Because that's too obvious, so never mind. Whoa, it's just like Sauron's eye, remember? So Elrond knows that Galadriel's responsible for Sauron's return, but yeah, she totally deserves that ring. And finally, this fucking show's over. Gandalf, hit it. Amazon is already underway filming a season two, and for the life of me, I don't know why anyone would expect this thing to improve. Nothing's changed besides the location where it's being filmed. It's still being led by the showrunners who had J.J. Abrams bribe Amazon into letting them do it, and now the company has to lie in the bed they've made. But hey, I guess when your bed looks like this, it doesn't really matter, does it? Don't forget to use my Raid Shadow Legends link in the description or scan my QR code to get awesome bonuses for new players with an epic champion. Mexico. Till next time. All GG's. I'm saying.